Triplanetary, first in the Lensman series by E. E. Doc Smith. Chapter Two: The Fall of Atlantis. Edor. Members of the innermost circle, wherever you are and whatever you may be doing, tune in. The All Highest Broadcast. Analysis of the data furnished by the survey just completed shows that in general the great plan is progressing satisfactorily. There seems to be only four planets which our delegates have not been or may not be able to control properly. Sol three, Rigel four, Valantia three, and Palane seven. All four, you will observe, are in the other galaxy. No trouble whatever has developed in our own. Of these four, the first requires drastic and immediate personal attention. Its people, in the brief interval since our previous general survey, have developed nuclear energy and have fallen into a cultural pattern which does not conform in any respect to the basic principles laid down by us long since. Our deputies there, thinking erroneously that they could handle matters without reporting fully to or calling for help upon the next higher operating echelon, must be disciplined sharply. Failure, from whatever cause, cannot be tolerated. Garlane, as Master Number Two, you will assume control of Sol Three immediately. This circle now authorizes and instructs you to take whatever steps may prove necessary to restore order upon that planet. Examine carefully this data concerning the other three worlds, which may very shortly become troublesome. Is it your thought that one or more others of this circle should be assigned to work with you? to be sure that these untoward developments are suppressed? It is not your supremacy that were the decided after a time of study. Since the peoples in question are as yet of low intelligence, since one form of flesh at a time is all that will have to be energized, and since the techniques will be essentially similar, I can handle all four more efficiently alone than with the help or cooperation of others. If I read this data correctly, there will be need of only the most elementary precaution in the employment of mental force, since of the four races only the Valentians have even a rudimentary knowledge of its uses, right? We so read the data. Surprisingly enough, the innermost circle agreed unanimously. Go then, when finished, report in full. I go, all highest. I shall render a complete and conclusive report. Arisia. We, the Elder Thinkers in Fusion, are spreading in public view for study and full discussion a visualization of the relationships existing and to exist between civilization and its irreconcilable and implacable foe. Several of our younger members, particularly Euconidor, who has just attained watchmanship, have requested instruction in this matter. Being as yet immature, their visualizations do not show clearly why Neddanelor, Critigan, Drunli, and Brolintine, either singly or in fusion, have in the past performed certain acts, and have not performed certain others, or that the future actions of those molders of civilization will be similarly constrained. This visualization, while more complex, more complete, and more detailed than the one set up by our forefathers at the time of the coalescence, agrees with it in every essential. The five basics remain unchanged. First, the Adorians can be overcome only by mental force. Secondly, the magnitude of the required force is such that its only possible generator is such an organization as the Galactic Patrol toward which we have been and are working. Third, since no Arisian or any fusion of Arisians will ever be able to spearhead that force, it was and is necessary to develop a race of mentality sufficient to perform that task. Fourth, this new race, having been instrumental in removing the menace of Ador, will, as a matter of course, displace the Arisians as guardians of civilization. Fifth, the Edorians must not become informed of us until such a time as it will be physically, mathematically impossible for them to construct any effective counter-devices. A cheerless outlook, truly, came a somber thought. Not so, daughter. 
a little reflection will show you that your present thinking is loose and turbid when that time comes every arisian will be ready for the change we know the way we do not know to what that way leads but the arisian purpose in this phase of existence this space-time continuum will have been fulfilled and we will go eagerly and joyfully on to the next are there any more questions there were none study this material then each of you with exceeding care it may be that some one of you even a child will perceive some facet of the truth which we have missed or have not examined fully some fact or implication which may be able to operate to shorten the time of conflict or to lessen the number of budding civilizations whose destruction seems to us at present to be surely unavoidable hours passed days no criticisms or suggestions were offered. We take it, then, that this visualization is the fullest and most accurate one possible for the massed intellect of Arisia to construct from the information available at the moment. The molders, therefore, after describing briefly what they have already done, will inform us as to what they deem it necessary to do in the near future. We have observed, and at times have guided, the evolution of intelligent life upon many planets the fusion began we have to the best of our ability directed the energies of these entities into the channels of civilization we have adhered consistently to the policy of steering as many different races as possible toward the intellectual level necessary for the effective use of the lens without which the proposed galactic patrol cannot come into being for many cycles of time we have been working as individuals with the four strongest races from one of which will be developed the people who will one day replace us as guardians of civilization bloodlines have been established we have encouraged matings which concentrate traits of strength and dissipate those of weakness while no very great departure from the norm either physically or mentally will take place until after the penultimates have been allowed to meet and to mate a definite general improvement of each race has been unavoidable thus the edorians have already interested themselves in our budding civilization upon the planet tellus and it is inevitable that they will very shortly interfere with our work upon the other three these four young civilizations must be allowed to fall it is to warn every arisian against well-meant but inconsidered action that this conference was called we ourselves will operate through the forms of flesh of no higher intelligence than and indistinguishable from the natives of the planets affected no traceable connection will exist between those forms and us no other Arisians will operate within extreme range of any one of those four planets. They will, from now on, be given the same status as has been so long accorded Edor itself. The Edorians must not learn of us until after it is too late for them to act effectively upon that knowledge. Any chance bit of information obtained by any Edorian must be obliterated at once. It is to guard against and to negate such accidental disclosures that our watchmen have been trained. But if all of our civilizations go down, you Conador began to protest, study will show you, youth, that the general level of mind and hence of strength is rising, the fused elders interrupted. The trend is ever upward, each peak and valley being higher than its predecessor. When the indicated level has been reached, the level at which the efficient use of the lens will become possible, we will not only allow ourselves to become known to them, we will engage them at every point. One factor remains obscure. A thinker broke the ensuing silence. In this visualization I do not perceive anything to preclude the possibility that the Adorians may at any time visualize us. Granted that the elders of long ago did not merely visualize the Adorians, but perceived them in time-space surveys, that they and subsequent elders were able to maintain the status quo, and that the Adorian way of thought is essentially mechanistic rather than philosophic in nature. There is still a possibility 
that the enemy may be able to deduce us by processes of logic alone. This thought is particularly disturbing to me at the present time because a rigid statistical analysis of the occurrences upon these four planets shows that they cannot possibly have been due to chance. With such an analysis as a starting point, a mind of even moderate ability could visualize us practically in toto. I assume, however, that this possibility has been taken into consideration, and suggest that the membership be informed. The point is well taken. The possibility exists. While the probability is very great that such an analysis will not be made until after we have declared ourselves, it is not a certainty. Immediately upon deducing our existence, however, the Adorians would begin to build against us, upon the four planets and elsewhere, since there is only one effective counter-structure possible, and since we elders have long been alert to detect the first indications of that particular activity, we know that the situation remains unchanged. If it changes, we will call at once another full meeting of minds. Are there any other matters of moment? If not, this conference will dissolve. Atlantis Aroponides recently elected Pharos of Atlantis for his third five-year term, stood at a window of his office atop the towering Ferostery. His hands were clasped loosely behind his back. He did not really see the tremendous expanse of quiet ocean, nor the bustling harbor, nor the metropolis spread out so magnificently and so busily beneath him. He stood there, motionless, until a subtle vibration warned him that visitors were approaching his door. "'Come in, gentlemen. Please be seated.' He sat down at one end of a table, molded of transparent plastic. Psychologist Talmonides, Statesman Cleto, Minister Philemon, Minister Mark says, and Officer Artomenes, I have asked you to come here personally because I have every reason to believe that the shielding of this room is proof against eavesdroppers, a thing which can no longer be said of our supposedly private television channels. We must discuss, and if possible, come to some decision concerning the state in which our nation now finds itself. Each of us knows within himself exactly what he is. Of our own powers we cannot surely know each other's inward selves. The tools and techniques of psychology, however, are potent and exact, and Talmonides, after exhaustive and rigorous examination of each one of us, has certified that no taint of disloyalty exists among us. "'Which certification is not worth a damn,' the burly officer declared. "'What assurance do we have that Talmonides himself is not one of the ringleaders?' Mind you, I have no reason to believe that he is not completely loyal. In fact, since he has been one of my best friends for over twenty years, I believe implicitly that he is. Nevertheless, the plain fact is, Aeroponides, that all the precautions you have taken, and any you can take, are and will be useless, in so far as definite knowledge is concerned. The real truth is and will remain unknown. You are right, the psychologist conceded. And such being the case, uh, perhaps I should withdraw from the meeting. That wouldn't help either. Artomenes shook his head. Any competent plotter would be prepared for this, as for any other contingency. One of us others would be the real operator. And the fact that our officer is the one who is splitting hairs so finely could be taken to indicate which one of us the real operator could be, Moxes pointed out cuttingly. "'Gentlemen, gentlemen,' Aeroponides protested. "'While absolute certainty is, of course, impossible to any finite mind, you all know how Talmonides was tested. You know that in his case there is no reasonable doubt. Such chance as exists, however, must be taken, for if we do not trust each other fully in this undertaking, failure is inevitable. With this word of warning I will get on with my report.' This worldwide frenzy of unrest followed closely upon the controlled liberation of atomic energy, and may be, probably is, traceable to it. It is in no part due to imperialistic aims or acts on the part of Atlantis. This fact cannot be stressed too strongly. We never have been, and are not now, interested in empire. 
It is true that the other nations began as Atlantean colonies, but no attempt was ever made to hold any one of them in colonial status against the wish of its electorate. All nations were, and are, sister states. We gain or lose together. Atlantis, the parent, was and is a clearing-house, a coordinator of effort, but has never claimed or sought authority to rule, all decisions being based upon free debate and free and secret ballot. But now, parties and factions everywhere, even in old Atlantis, every nation is torn by internal dissensions and strife. Nor is that all. Ughar, as a nation, is insensately jealous of the islands of the south, who in turn are jealous of Maya, Maya of Bantu, Bantu of Ekopt, Ekopt of Norheim, and Norheim of Ughar. A vicious circle, worsened by other jealousies and hatreds intercrossing everywhere, each fears that some other is about to try to seize control of the entire world and there seems to be spreading rapidly the utter baseless belief that Atlantis itself is about to reduce all other nations of earth to vassalage. This is a bald statement of the present condition of the world as I see it. Since I can see no other course possible within the constituted framework of our democratic government, I recommend that we continue our present activities, such as the international treaties and agreements upon which we are now at work, intensifying our effort wherever possible. We will now hear from Statesman Cleto. You have outlined the situation clearly enough, Pharos. My thought, however, is that the principal cause of the trouble is the coming into being of this multiplicity of political parties, particularly those composed principally of crackpots and extremists. The connection with atomic energy is clear, since the atomic bomb gives a small group of people the power to destroy the world. Uh, they reason that it thereby confers upon them the authority to dictate to the world. My recommendation is merely a special case of yours, that every effort be made to influence the electorates of Norheim and Uygar into supporting an effective international control of atomic energy. "'You have your data tabulated in symbolics?' asked Talmonides from his seat at the keyboard of a calculating machine. "'Yes, here they are. Thanks.' "'Minister Philemon,' the Pharos announced. "'As I see it, as any intelligent man should be able to see it, the principal contribution of atomic energy to this worldwide chaos was the complete demoralization of labor,' the gray-haired Minister of Trade stated flatly. Output per man-hour should have gone up at least twenty per cent, in which cases prices would automatically have come down. Instead, short-sighted guilds imposed drastic curbs on production, and now seem to be surprised that as production falls and hourly wages rise, prices also rise and real income drops. Only one course is possible, gentlemen. Labor must be made to listen to reason. This feather-bedding, this protected loafing, this—I protest, Mark says, Minister of Work, leaped to his feet. The blame lies squarely with the capitalists, their greed, their rapacity, their exploitation of— One moment, please, Ariponides rapped the table sharply. It is highly significant of the deplorable condition of the times that two ministers of state should speak as you two have just spoken. I take it that neither of you has anything new to contribute to this symposium. Both claimed the floor, but both were refused it by vote. Hand your tabulated data to Talmonides, the pharaohs directed. Officer Artemines, you, our pharaoh, have more than intimated that our defense program, for which I am primarily responsible, has been largely to blame for what has happened. The grizzled warrior began. In part, perhaps it was, uh, one must be blind, indeed, not to see the connection, and biased, indeed, not to admit it. But what should I have done? Knowing that there is no practical defense against the atomic bomb, every nation has them, and is manufacturing more and more. Every nation is infested with the agents of every other. Should I have tried to keep Atlantis toothless in a world bristling with fangs? 
and could I, or anyone else, have succeeded in doing so? Probably not. No criticism was intended. We must deal with the situation as it actually exists. Your recommendations, please? I have thought this thing over, day and night, and can see no solution which can be made acceptable to our, to any real democracy. Nevertheless, I have one recommendation to make. We all know that Norheim and Uygar are the sore spots, particularly Norheim. We have more bombs as of now than both of them together. We know that Uygar's supersonic jobs are ready. We don't know exactly what Norheim has since they cut my intelligence line a while back, but I'm sending over another operative, my best man, too, tonight. If he finds out that we have enough advantage in speed, and I'm pretty sure that we have, I say hit both Norheim and Uygar right then while we can before they hit us, and hit them hard, pulverize them. Then set up a world government strong enough to knock out any nation, including Atlantis, that will not cooperate with it. This course of action is flagrantly against all international law and all the principles of democracy I know, and even it might not work. It is, however, as far as I can see, the only course which can work. You, we all perceive its weaknesses. The Pharos thought for minutes. You cannot be sure that your intelligence has located all of the danger points, and many of them must go so far underground as to be safe from even our heaviest missiles. We all, including you, believe that the psychologist is right in holding that the reaction of the other nations to such action would be both unfavorable and violent. Your report, please, Talmonides. I have already put my data into the integrator. The psychologist punched a button and the mechanism began to whir and to click. I have only one new fact of any importance. The name of one of the higher-ups and its corollary implication that there may be some degree of cooperation between Norheim and Uygar. He broke off as the machine stopped clicking and ejected its report. Look at that graph! Up ten points in seven days! Talmonides pointed a finger. The situation is deteriorating faster and faster. The conclusion is unavoidable. You can see yourselves that this summation line is fast approaching unity, that the outbreaks will become uncontrollable in approximately eight days. With one slight exception here, you will notice that the lines of organization and purpose are as random as ever. In spite of this conclusive integration, I would be tempted to believe that this seeming lack of coherence was due to insufficient data, that back of this whole movement there is a carefully set up and completely integrated plan, except for the fact that the factions and the nations are so evenly matched. But the data are sufficient. It is shown conclusively that no one of the other nations can possibly win even by totally destroying Atlantis. They would merely destroy each other, and our entire civilization. According to this forecast, in arriving at which the data furnished by our officer were prime determinants, that will surely be the outcome unless remedial measures be taken at once. You are of course sure of your facts, Artemines? I am sure. But you said you had a name, and that it indicated a Nornheim Uygar hookup. What is that name? An old friend of yours. Lo Sung? The words as spoken were a curse of fury. None other. And unfortunately there is as yet no course of action indicated which is at all promising of success. Use mine, then. Artomenes jumped up and banged the table with his fist. Let me send two flights of rockets over right now that will blow Ugastari and Norgrad into radioactive dust and make a thousand square miles around each of them uninhabitable for ten thousand years. If that's the only way they can learn anything, let them learn. Sit down, officer, our opponents directed quietly. That course, as you have already pointed out, is indefensible. It violates every prime basic of our civilization. Moreover, it would be entirely futile, since this resultant makes it clear that every nation on earth would be destroyed within the day. What then? Artomenes demanded bitterly. Sit still here and let them annihilate us? Not necessarily. 
It is to formulate plans that we are here. Talmonides will by now have decided, upon the basis of our pooled knowledge, what must be done. The outlook is not good, not good at all, the psychologist announced gloomily. The only course of action which carries any promise whatever of success, and its probability is only point one eight, is the one recommended by the Pharos, modified slightly to include Artominus's suggestion of sending his best operative on the indicated mission. For highest morale, by the way, the Pharos should also interview this agent before he sets out. Ordinarily, I would not advocate a course of action having so little likelihood of success, but since it is simply a continuation and intensification of what we are already doing, I do not see how we can adopt any other. Are we agreed? Ariponides asked, after a short silence. They were agreed. Four of the conferees filed out, and a brisk young man strode in. Although he did not look at the pharaohs, his eyes asked questions. Reporting for orders, sir, he saluted the officer punctiliously. At ease, sir, Artomenes returned the salute. You were called here for a word with the pharaohs, sir, I present Captain Fridges. Not orders, son, no. Ariponides' right hand rested in greeting upon the captain's left shoulder. Wise old eyes probed deeply into the gold-flecked tawny eyes of youth. The pharaohs saw, without really noticing, a flaming thatch of red bronze auburn hair. I asked you here to wish you well, not only for myself, but for all our nation and perhaps for our entire race. While everything in my being rebels against an unprovoked and unannounced assault, we may be compelled to choose between our officer's plan of campaign and the destruction of civilization. Since you already know the vital importance of your mission, I need not enlarge upon it. But I want you to know fully, Captain Fridges, that all Atlantis flies with you this night. Th thank you, sir. Fridges gulped twice to steady his voice. I'll do my best, sir. And later, in a wingless craft flying toward the airfield, young Fridges broke a long silence. So that is the Pharos. I like him, officer. I have never seen him close up before. There's something about him. He isn't like my father much, but it seems as though I have known him for a thousand years. Hm. Peculiar. You two are a lot alike at that, even though you don't look anything like each other. Can't put a finger on exactly what it is, but it's there. Although Artomenes nor any other of his time could place it, the resemblance was indeed there. It was in and back of the eyes. It was the look of eagles which was long later to become associated with the wearers of Arisia's lenses. But here we are, and your ship's ready. Luck, son. Thanks, sir. But one more thing. If it should—if I don't get back, will you see that my wife and the baby are— I will, son. They will leave for North Maya tomorrow morning. They will live whether you and I do or not. Anything else? No, sir. Thanks. Goodbye. The ship was a tremendous flying wing, a standard commercial job. Empty passengers, even crewmen, were never subjected to the brutal accelerations regularly used by unmanned carriers. Phryges scanned the panel. Tiny motors were pulling tapes through the controllers. Every light showed green. Everything was set. Donning a waterproof coverall, he slid through a flexible valve into his acceleration tank and waited. A siren yelled briefly. Black night turned blinding white as the harnessed energies of the atom were released. For five and six tenths seconds the sharp, hard, beryllium bronze leading edge of the back-sweeping V sliced its way through ever-thinning air. The vessel seemed to pause momentarily, paused and bucked viciously. She shuddered and shivered, tried to tear herself into shreds and chunks, but Phryges in its tank was unconcerned. Earlier weaker ships went to pieces against the solid-seeming wall of atmospheric incompressibility at the velocity of sound, but this one was built solidly enough and powered to hit that wall hard enough to go through unharmed. The hellish vibration ceased. 
The fantastic violence of the drive subsided to a mere shove. Phryges knew that the vessel had leveled off at its cruising speed of two thousand miles per hour. He emerged, spilling the least possible amount of water upon the polished steel floor. He took off his coverall and stuffed it back through the valve into the tank. He mopped and polished the floors with towels, which likewise went into the tank. He drew on a pair of soft gloves and, by manual control, jettisoned the acceleration tank and all the apparatus which had made that unloading possible. This junk would fall into the ocean, would sink, would never be found. He examined the compartment and the hatch minutely. No scratches, no scars, no mars, no tell-tale marks or prints of any kind. Let the Norsky search. So far, so good. Back toward the trailing edge, then, to a small escape hatch beside which was fastened a dull black ball. The anchoring device went out first. He gasped as the air rushed out into the near vacuum, but he had been trained to take sudden and violent fluctuations in pressure. He rolled the ball out upon the hatch, where he opened it, two hinged hemispheres, each heavily padded with molded composition resembling sponge rubber. It seemed incredible that any man as big as Phryges, especially when wearing a parachute, could be crammed into a space so small but that lining had been molded to fit. The ball had to be small. The ship, even though it was on a regularly scheduled commercial flight, would be scanned intensively and continuously from the moment of entering Norheimen radar range. Since the ball would be invisible on any radar screen, no suspicion would be aroused, particularly since, as far as Atlantean intelligence had been able to discover, the Nordheimans had not yet succeeded in perfecting any device by use of which a living man could bail out of a supersonic plane. Phryges waited and waited, until the second hand of his watch marked the arrival of zero time. He curled up into one half of the ball, the other half closed over him and locked. The hatch opened. Ball and closely prisoned man plummeted downward, slowing abruptly with a horrible deceleration to terminal velocity. Had the air been any trifle thicker, the Atlantean captain would have died then and there, but that too had been computed accurately and Phryges lived. As the ball bulleted downward on a screaming slant, it shrank. This too, the Atlanteans hoped, was new a synthetic which air friction would erode away molecule by molecule so rapidly that no perceptible fragment of it would reach ground. The casing disappeared, and the yielding porous lining, and Phryges, still at an altitude of over thirty thousand feet, kicked away the remaining fragments of his cocoon, and by judicious planning turned himself so that he could see the ground now dimly visible in the first dull gray of dawn. There was the highway, paralleling his line of flight. He wouldn't miss it more than a hundred yards. He fought down an almost overwhelming urge to pull his ripcord too soon. He had to wait, wait until the last possible second, because parachutes were big, and Norheimian radar practically swept the ground. Low enough at last, he pulled the ring. Zrick whap! The chute banged open. His harness tightened with a savage jerk mere seconds before his hard-sprung knees took the shock of landing. That was close, too close. He was white and shaking, but unhurt, as he gathered in the billowing fighting sheet and rolled it, together with his harness, into a wad. He broke open a tiny ampule, and as the drops of liquid touched it the stout fabric began to disappear. It did not burn. It simply disintegrated and vanished. In less than a minute there remained only a few steel snaps and rings, which the Atlantean buried under a meticulously replaced circle of sod. He was still on schedule. In less than three minutes the signals would be on the air and he would know where he was, unless the Norsks had succeeded in finding and eliminating the whole Atlantean undercover group. He pressed a stud on a small instrument, held it down. A line burned green across the dial, flared red, vanished. Damn, he breathed explosively. The strength of the signal 
told him that he was within a mile or so of the hideout, first-class computation. But the red flash warned him to keep away. Kinexa, it had to be Kinexa, would come to him. How? By air? Along the road? Through the woods? On foot? He had no way of knowing. Talking even on a tight beam was out of the question. He made his way to the highway and crouched behind a tree. Here she could come at him by any route of the three. Again he waited, pressing infrequently a stud of his cinder. A long, low-slung ground car swung around the curve, and Phrygis's binoculars were at his eyes. It was Kinexa, or a duplicate. At the thought he dropped his glasses and pulled his guns, blaster in right hand, air pistol in left. But no, that wouldn't do. She'd be suspicious, too. She'd have to be. And that car probably mounted heavy stuff. If he stepped out, ready for business, she'd fry him in quick. Maybe not. She might have protection, but he couldn't take the chance. The car slowed, stopped. The girl got out, examined a front tire, straightened up, and looked down the road straight at Phrygis's hiding place. This time the binoculars brought her up to a little more than arm's length. Tall, blonde, beautifully built, the slightly crooked left eyebrow the thread line of gold betraying a one-tooth bridge, and the tiny scar on her upper lip, for both of which he had been responsible, she always did insist on playing cops and robbers with boys older and bigger than herself. It was Kinexa. Not even Norheim's science could imitate so perfectly every personalizing characteristic of a girl he had known ever since she was knee-high to a duck. The girl slid back into her seat and the heavy car began to move. Open-handed, Phryges stepped out into its way. The car stopped. Turn around, back up to me, hands behind you, she directed crisply. The man, although surprised, obeyed. Not until he felt a finger exploring the short hair at the back of his neck did he realize what she was seeking, the almost imperceptible scar marking the place where she had bit him when she was seven years old. Oh, Fry, it is you, really you. Thank the gods. I've been ashamed of that all my life, but now— He whirled and caught her as she slumped, but she did not quite faint. Quick, get in, drive on, not too fast, she cautioned sharply as the tires began to scream. The speed limit along here is seventy, and we can't be picked up. Easy it is, Kenny, but give. What's the score? Where's Kalanides? Or rather, what happened to him? Dead. So are the others, I think. They put him on a psycho bench and turned him inside out. But the blocks? Didn't hold. Over here they add such trimmings as skinning and salt to the regular psycho routine, but none of them knew anything about me, nor about how their reports were picked up, or I'd have been dead too. But it doesn't make any difference, Fry. We're just one week too late. What do you mean, too late? Speed it up. His tone was rough but the hand he placed on her arm was gentleness itself. I'm telling you as fast as I can. I picked up his last report day before yesterday. They have missiles just as big and just as fast as ours, maybe more so, and they are going to fire one at Atlantis tonight at exactly seven o'clock. Tonight? Holy gods! The man's mind raced. Yes, Kinex's voice was low, uninflected and there was nothing in the world that I could do about it. If I approached any one of our places, or tried to use a beam strong enough to reach anyone, I would simply have got picked up, too. I've thought and thought, but could figure out only one thing that might possibly be of any use, and I couldn't do that alone. But two of us, perhaps. Go on, brief me. Nobody ever accused you of not having a brain, and you know this whole country like the palm of your hand. Steal a ship. Be over at the ramp at exactly seven pay Emma. When the lid opens, go into a full power dive. Beam or Tomines, if I had a second before they blanketed my wave, and meet their rocket head on in their own launching tube. This was stark stuff, but so tense was the moment, and so highly keyed up were the two that neither of them saw anything out of the ordinary in it. Not bad if we can't figure out anything better. The joker being, of course, that you didn't see how you could steal a ship? Exactly. 
I can't carry blasters. No woman in Norheim is wearing a coat or a cloak now. So I can't either. And just look at this dress. Do you see any place where I could hide even one? He looked appreciatively, and she had the grace to blush. Can't say that I do, he admitted. But I'd rather have one of our own ships if we could make the approach. Could both of us make it, do you suppose? Not a chance. They keep at least one man inside all the time. Even if we killed everybody outside, the ship would take off before we could get close enough to open the port with the outside controls. Probably. Go on. But first, are you sure that you're in the clear? Positive. She grinned mirthlessly. The fact that I am still alive is conclusive evidence that they didn't find out anything about me. But I don't want you to work on that idea, if you can think of a better one. I've got passports and so on for you to be anything you want to be, from a tube man up to an Ecoptian banker. Ditto for me, for us both, as Mr. and Mrs. Smart girl. He thought for minutes, then shook his head. No possible way that I can see. The sneak boat isn't due for a week, and from what you've said it probably won't get here. But you might make it at that. I'll drop you somewhere. You will not, she interrupted, quietly but definitely. Which would you rather? Go out in a blast like that one will be, beside a good Atlantean? Or, after deserting him, be psychoed, skinned, salted, and, still alive, drawn and quartered? Together, then, all the way, he assented man and wife, tourists, newlyweds from some town not too far away, pretty well fixed to match what we're riding in. Can do? Very simple. She opened a compartment and selected one of a stack of documents. I can fix this one up in ten minutes. Uh, we'll have to dispose of the rest of these, and a lot of other stuff, too. And you had better get out of that leather and into a suit that matches this passport photo. Right. Straight road for miles and nothing in sight either way. Give me the suit, and I'll change now. Keep on going or stop? Better stop, I think, the girl decided. Quicker, and we'll have to find a place to hide and bury this evidence. While the man changed his clothes, Conexa collected the contraband, wrapping it up in the discarded jacket. She looked up just as Phryges was adjusting his coat. She glanced at his armpits, then stared. Where are your blasters? she demanded. They ought to show at least a little, and even I can't see a sign of them. He showed her. But they are so tiny. I never saw blasters like that. I've got a blaster, but it's in the tail pocket. These aren't. They're air guns, poisoned needles. Not worth a damn beyond a hundred feet, but deadly close up. One touch, anywhere, and the guy dies right there. Two seconds, Max. Nice. She was no shrinking violet, this young Atlantean spy. You have spares, of course, and I can hide two of them easily enough in leg holsters. Gimme, and show me how they work. Standard controls, pretty much like blasters, like so. He demonstrated, and as he drove sedately down the highway, the girl sewed industriously. The day wore on, nor was it uneventful. One incident, in fact, the detailing of which would serve no useful purpose here, was of such a nature that at its end— Better pinpoint me, don't you think, on that ramp? Phryges asked quietly. Just in case you get scragged in one of these brawls, and I don't. Oh, of course. Uh, forgive me, Fry. It slipped my mind completely that you didn't know where it was. Area 6, pinpoint 473-605. Got it. He repeated the figures. But neither of the Atlanteans was scragged, and at 6 p.m. an allegedly honeymooning couple parked their big roadster in the garage at Norgrad Field and went through the gates. Their papers, tickets included, were in perfect order. They were as inconspicuous and as undemonstrative as newlyweds were wont to be, no more so and no less. Strolling idly, gazing eagerly at each new thing, they made their circuitous way toward a certain small hangar. As the girl had said, this field boasted hundreds of supersonic fighters, so many that servicing was a round-the-clock routine. In that hangar was a sharp-nosed, stubby v flyer, one of Norheim's fastest. It was serviced and ready. It was too much to hope, of course, that the visitors would actually get into the building unchallenged, nor did they. Back, you. A guard waved them away. Get back to the concourse where you belong. No visitors allowed out here. Fit, fit. 
Phrygis's air-gun broke into soft but deadly coughing. Canexa whirled, hands flashing down, skirt flying up, and ran. Guards tried to head her off, tried to bring their own weapons to bear, tried, failed, died. Phrygis's, too, ran backward. His blaster was out now and flaming, for no living enemy remained within needle range. A rifle bullet winged past his head, making him duck involuntarily and uselessly. Rifles were bad, but their hazard, too, had been considered and had been accepted. Conexa reached the fighter's port, opened it, sprang in. He jumped. She fell against him. He tossed her clear, slammed and dogged the door. He looked at her then and swore bitterly. A small round hole marred the bridge of her nose. The back of her head was gone. He leaped to the controls, and the fleet little ship screamed skyward. He cut in transmitter and receiver, keyed and twiddled briefly. No soap. He had been afraid of that. They were already blanketing every frequency he could employ, using power through which he could not drive even a tight beam a hundred miles. But he could still crash that missile in its tube. Or could he? He was not afraid of other Norheimian fighters. He had a long lead, and he rode one of their very fastest. But since they were already so suspicious, wouldn't they launch the bomb before seven o'clock? He tried vainly to coax another knot out of his wide-open engines. With all his speed he neared the pinpoint just in time to see a trail of superheated vapor extending up into and disappearing beyond the stratosphere. He nosed his flyer upward, locked the missile into his sights, and leveled off. Although his ship did not have the giant rocket's acceleration, he could catch it before it got to Atlantis, since he did not need its altitude, and since most of its journey would be made without power. What he could do about it after he caught it, he did not know, but he'd do something. He caught it, and by a feat of piloting to be appreciated only by those who have handled planes at supersonic speeds, he matched its course and velocity. Then, from a distance of barely a hundred feet, he poured his heaviest shells into the missile's warhead. He couldn't be missing. It was worse than shooting sitting ducks. It was like dynamiting fish in a bucket. Nevertheless, nothing happened. The thing wasn't fused for impact then, but for time, and the activating mechanism would be shell and shock-proof. But there was still a way. He didn't need to call Artomenes now. Even if he could get through the interference which the fast-approaching pursuers were still sending out, Atlantean observers would have lined this stuff up long since. The officer would know exactly what was going on. Driving ahead and downward at maximum power, Phryges swung his ship slowly into a right-angle collision course. The fighter's needle-nose struck the warhead within a foot of the Atlantean's point of aim, and, as he died, Phryges knew that he had accomplished his mission. Norheim's missile would not strike Atlantis, but would fall at least ten miles short, and the water there was very deep, very, very deep. Atlantis would not be harmed. It might have been better, however, if Phryges had died with Conexa on Norgrad Field, in which case the continent would probably have endured. As it was, while that one missile did not reach the city, its frightful atomic charge exploded under six hundred fathoms of water, ten scant miles from Atlantis's harbor, and very close to an ancient geological fault. Artomenes, as Phryges had surmised, had had time in which to act, and he knew much more than Phryges did about what was coming toward Atlantis. Too late he knew that not one missile, but seven had been launched from Norheim, and at least five from Uygar. The retaliatory rockets which were to wipe out Norgrad, Uygastoy, and thousands of square miles of environs were on their way long before either bomb or earthquake destroyed all of the Atlantean launching ramps. But when equilibrium was at last restored, the ocean rolled serenely where a minor continent had been. End of chapter two of Triplanetary First in the Lensman series.